God heard your prayer this morning. I hope you do. I hope you do. We've been studying in Bible study. We've been talking about the work of the Holy Spirit, person of the Holy Spirit. And on this past week, we talked about some benefits or the work of the Spirit in the believer. And we talked about one of the roles that the Holy Spirit plays in our lives, and that is the role of intercessor. In the 8th chapter of Romans, around the 26th verse, Paul mentions those times in our lives when we don't know how to pray. He said that the Spirit works for us in our weaknesses for the seasons when we don't know what to pray for. But he says that the Spirit makes intercessions for us, these groanings that are too deep for our understanding. Paul says that there are times in our lives when we just simply don't know how to pray. You ever been there before? Those times where the concern is just so heavy that you, don't, you can't find the words. You don't know where to start. You don't know where to begin. You can't wrap your mind around the circumstances that are before you. Paul says in those times the Holy Spirit knows just what to say. One of the fundamental understandings that we have of the Holy Spirit is that he is God. That means then that God has a conversation with himself through you. That God does not need us to inform him of the need he already knows. When we're praying, our prayers are not the deliverance of information, but our prayers are the surrender of our heart. So prayer is not a matter of vocabulary, but prayer is just a matter of trust and faith. That God does not leave it up to me to know how things need to work out. Because if I knew how they needed to work out, then is there a real need for God? Sometimes the Lord just keeps us in the dark. He just wants to know, will you trust me that I will take care of it? That's not my sermon this morning, but I'm just simply admonishing our congregation to continue praying. And to trust God, even when you don't know how to pray, know that prayer still works. Prayer still happens. Amen? Amen. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the book of Acts, the 12th chapter. I want to read a passage of scripture that I believe would be fitting for all of what we've been talking about as we can relate to our season of celebration, our church anniversary, and even about what God does in this particular worship setting. In the 12th chapter of Acts, I'm going to begin reading at verse number 11. This is around the period of Peter's miraculous deliverance from prison. Verse 11, it says, Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said, and then he left for another place. I want to use this narrative this morning. Uh, I want to talk about this thought. Don't diss the younger generation. Don't diss the younger or the next generation. Now listen, everybody in here is young. Everybody. That way I don't offend nobody. That just means that that some of us are younger than others. Everybody's young, and we all can recall periods and seasons when our youth was not always affirmed or embraced. In fact, it was because of our youth that our youth placed us in certain positions. 
our youth would 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 confine us it would disqualify us from certain spaces come on now you know that when you were young there were certain conversations that you could not participate in when you were young you could be present but you did not have a voice somebody know what I'm talking about that, that there were times when you could overhear that you know that you couldn't sit at the grown folks table when they were having the Thanksgiving meal, the kids would have to sit in another part of the house. You had to sit on the card tables. and You'd have to sit in, so at the TV trays. You'd, you would have to sit at the makeshift table. And you didn't get the good dishes that you had to eat off the old stuff. But the adults would be in the dining room with the place settings and the, and the heirloom china. And all of that, you got the paper plates and the sippy cups and the, and the, the Dixie cups and stuff like that. But, but because of youth and, and there, were, there were times when we look and we track the, the movement in our nation's history, there were seasons where youth, youthful generations were silenced or they were dismissed. They were cast aside. Their voice was not affirmed or recognized but nonetheless these youthful movements they indeed were movements that they become forces to be reckoned with I remember in the early 90s in Fort Worth Texas there was a young musician in Fort Worth who was a writer and a choir director who was a high school student at O.D. Wyatt High School and his choir instructor's name was a lady by the name of Miss Kelly and Miss Kelly had a young man who was a prodigy, who was writing songs at the time for the DFW Mass Choir. I remember my freshman year in college, this young man had a group, and they came and participated in our praise fest when I sang in the Good News Gospel Choir at the University of Houston. He was somewhat of an outcast. He was somewhat of a, you know, he was young. He was the young boy, the, the new kid on the block. He wasn't necessarily embraced or taken as seriously. After all, he was not one of the big names. He was, he was not well known. He was, he was riding on chartered buses and tour buses. You know, he was riding on the bus going from engagement to engagement. And he had a little group. And back then, in 1993, his name was Kurt Franklin. And he was singing with Kirk Franklin and the family. And at the time, everybody was marketing Milton Brunson and the Mississippi Mass Choir and all these big choirs, Orlando Draper and people like that. But there was this new sound coming. There was the small group, Kirk Franklin and the family. The reason why we sing, that was the song that was popular that would revolutionize and change gospel music and it would change it forever. Don't diss the younger generation. Do you remember it back in the 60s? I don't remember this, but back in the late 60s and the 70s and 80s, you know, there were some brothers that were in the city of New York, and then they started out with a couple of turntables and started doing something differently with music. And so they became, it wasn't called disc jockeying, but they were DJs. And so DJing and mixtapes and people like the Sugar Hill Gang and these guys started coming out with rap music and they called it hip hop. And so some of you all remember when hip hop came out, you called it noise and racket and you didn't want to hear that. And it was trash and garbage and nobody would pay for it. But here we are now and there is a such thing as the hip hop generation. That there is now a hip, the hip hop movement is a multi-billion dollar industry that is a culture all of itself. And whether you want to accept it or not, you are looking and living and breathing hip hop right now. That hip hop influences every area of your life. Now you can silence it, you can squash it, you can put it away, you can turn off your radio, but nonetheless hip hop ain't going nowhere. Don't diss younger generations. 
phones. And now, you know, there was a time when you thought nobody would want a phone that did not have a cord to it. And so we would diss people who had cordless phones. Remember when the first cordless phone had the long antenna that you would pull out and you would not trust it. There was a time when you would not dare think about putting a card into a machine and getting cash out of it. You wanted to walk into the bank and write out your withdrawal slip and give it to the teller with your driver's license and wait for the teller to give you back your cash money and you would write it down in your ledger. But now we, nobody would imagine life without an ATM card. But still, let me help y'all, some of y'all still, who will not trust e-commerce, that you still want to run to the grocery store to pay your water bill and your utility bill, and then you want to run up the street and around the corner and pay this bill and that bill, while there are some people from a younger generation that would take care of all of their expenses and bills right there from the comfort of their own home, from the driver's seat of their car, with their cell phone, with their iPad, with their laptop, and so you can push back all you want, but it is here to stay, and so you cannot dismiss younger generations. Why am I making such a big deal? Because in the text, the saints were having a prayer meeting in Mary's house, the mother of John Mark, and they were praying for their brother Peter, their beloved Peter. Peter who would preach on Pentecost and 3,000 souls get saved. Peter who was standing outside the gate called Beautiful with John and the, and the beggar was healed. That same Peter who would be the first pope, who would be the first preacher, the first pastor, the first, the first ambassador for the body of Christ, that Peter, he was in jail and the saints were gathered in Mary's house and they were praying. And while they were praying, there was a knock at the door. But who, who was praying? The old folk were praying. The, the elders were praying. The elite were praying. They said Mary had to have money because she had a house big enough for an assembly and she had a servant. And so the grown folk were praying and the people with status were praying and the people with influence were praying and the people who felt like they could get a prayer through were praying but somebody else was there there was a young girl a slave girl by the name of Rhoda who was in the biz in the vicinity as well and Rhoda did not have status and she did not have clout and she did not have money she was property but she was still there praying and while they are praying there is a knock at the door and so that I don't get ahead of myself, just know that we're going to walk through this narrative and Rhoda for us will represent the next generation. Rhoda will represent the younger generation. And based on Rhoda's activity and the choices that she makes, that we too will get some insight about how we must learn to embrace, affirm, and appreciate a generation behind us that we do not understand. But just because we don't understand them does not mean that they are not valuable to us and valuable to God. Amen? So let me help you with something right here. The first thing is, is that we cannot dismiss their spirit. The word that will be recurring throughout this, this, this message this morning is the word dismiss. I, I purposely chose the word dis. When I say that we can't diss the next generation, diss being short for disrespect or dismiss or discredit or, or whatever you want to put there, but we cannot diss them. We cannot dismiss their spirit. For you see, the saints were having prayer meetings. They were having prayer meetings and the folk who were invited, they felt like these are the people who are supposed to be here. They were having a prayer meeting. And they were the seasoned individuals. The seasoned saints had come together to pray. The seasoned saints were aware of the circumstances and they had come together to pray. The seasoned saints were aware of the circumstances and they came together to pray. The seasoned saints had come together because they were aware of the circumstances and they decided to pray. The seasoned saints 
the older saints, the leading saints, the saints in position currently, the saints who had influence and clout for the time being had come together to pray. But while the saints who had clout and position and prominence had come together to pray, there was another saint who was present as well. This saint did not have the season. This saint did not have the clout. This saint did not have the prestige. This saint did not have the status. But this saint still recognized the value of prayer. This saint had the wherewithal and understood that though she was not a part of the group, her prayers could not be discounted. This saint understood that she knew that after, after all, she had to know the weight of the circumstances because of her reaction when she goes to answer the door. I need, to help, I need you to follow me here that we cannot dismiss their spirit because the Bible says that she was a slave girl. And as a slave girl, she has no status. She is property. As a slave girl, she has no real presence. Because as a servant, she is ordered to go to and fro at the beck and call of those who have status. As a slave girl, she is not counted in the number. She is not worthy of the assembly. She is just a slave girl. I don't know who I'm preaching to this morning, but people have tried to dismiss you from the status quo. People have tried to discount you from the crowd. People have tried to push you to the side and put you at the young folks table and give you the menial task because they felt like you were not worthy of the big folks conversation. I don't know who's here this morning, but you know what it feels like to have been dissed and dismissed and discounted and discredited, but don't give up. Just know that your prayers can be prayed from the little table just like they can from the big table. God is not concerned about how other folk will dismiss you because God will never dismiss your spirit. Yes, you can lock me out of your meeting. You can lock me out of your room and you can remove me out of your situation but my prayers can still go up and God will sometimes hear me better when I'm dismissed than he can when I'm in the midst of all of your confusion so the folk were having a meeting but the slave wasn't a part of the meeting but she still had her own moment with God y'all still ain't hearing this let me let me let me tell it give it to you a different kind of way let me give you American history. In American history, you do know that the United States of America was founded upon Christian principles. We are supposed to be one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. But I want to call into question this under God piece. Do you know that when slaves were taught literacy, they were taught literacy by giving them the King James Bible? And the passages of scripture that they were using to teach slaves were passages such as slaves obey your masters. They were using the Bible to keep slaves in their place and keep them docile and keep them broken and keep them bruised and keep them battered and keep them without status so that they would not try to rise up. But there was a slave by the name of Nat Turner and Nat Turner took the same Bible and took those same scriptures and found his identity in the Bible that said that he was nothing but a slave but to God he was his child and so I don't know who's here this morning but to my younger folk you might not be at the head of the table you might not be at the big table you might not have the top seat but you got prayers that can be heard you got a spirit that matters to God you got a voice and a perspective and a concern that the Lord certainly does here. So to all of my rota generation in here, don't worry about not being with the big folk. You are your own people and you got your own voice and the Lord knows who you are. Now you can't dismiss their spirit. She might not have had leadership status. She might not have had 
any kind of significant contribution to the conversation. After all, she was just a slave girl. She wasn't even a Jew. But nonetheless, she knew God. And she knew God well enough to know that if I pray to my heavenly father, he will hear my prayers. And so she was doing what everybody else was doing. We don't know if she was down on her knees with everybody else. We don't know if she got to lock hands with everybody and, and lock arms and all that. We don't know if she got to do that or if she had to stand back by the door. But nonetheless, wherever she was, she was praying as well. Maybe the next generation might not call him the way that we call him. But don't think that because they're not in your presence that they're not calling him. And don't think that because they're not doing it when you do it that they don't do it at all. And don't think now that when you're doing it that they're not watching. And don't think that they're not observing and that they are not, they are not gaining their own understanding based on your activity. So be careful what you model before the next generation. Amen. But listen, can't dismiss their spirit, but we cannot dismiss their perspective either. Rhoda had a unique perspective, see. Rhoda was, was a servant. When the knock came at the door, who goes and answers the door? It was Mary's house, but the servant went and answered the door. The knock came at the door, and it was not the owner who answered the door, but it was the servant. The saints were busy praying. The saints were busy having their meeting. The saints were busy at the task at hand. And so they got so caught up in the meeting that they had missed what they were meeting for. They were so in tune with what they were doing that they had lost sight of the purpose for why they were doing what they were doing. But it took somebody on the outside, somebody who had been discounted, somebody who had been uh, dismissed. It took this person who had enough sensitivity to what was going on outside of the meeting. See, don't get so caught up in the meeting that you miss what's happening outside. I'm going to say it a different way. Don't get so tied to your meetings that your meetings ain't no good for what's happening outside of the meeting. Don't make your meeting be your religion. Don't make your meeting be your discipleship. Don't make the meeting be the main thing because the meeting is so that we can do the main thing. But if we be so careful locking folk out of our meeting that God will let us just have our meeting and God will do his work outside of the meeting. So then, Rhoda, I don't want you to feel bad if you're not invited to the party. Just have your own party. And just know this, that God can show up wherever he wants to. And so the Bible says that there was a knock at the door, and Mary didn't go answer it because she was praying. And the other saints didn't go answer it because they were praying. All the saints were praying, but Rhoda went to go answer the door. And the Bible says that when she goes and answers the door, she asks, who is it? And this is the outer gate outside under the cover of darkness. And Peter says, it's me. Rhoda connects the dots. We in the house praying for Peter. And the Lord has answered our prayer. She gets so excited that she runs back and tries to tell everybody, Peter is outside knocking at the door. And they dismissed her yet again. They said, child, you're crazy. Get on out of here with that foolishness. Can't you see that the grown folk in here praying? I don't know what kind of language they use, but I'm sure that it went something like that. I don't know how they said it, but I'm sure that they chastised Rhoda real good. I'm sure that they tried to put Rhoda back in her place. I'm sure that they tried to let Rhoda know, Rhoda, you don't know what you're talking about because Peter is in jail. Why you think we praying for him? But Rhoda ain't crazy. Rhoda say, I know Peter's in jail, and I know that's why we praying for him. I'm just trying to tell you that God has answered your prayer. 
But the people say, Rhoda, you must be crazy. Peter is in jail. That's why we praying for him. But why are you going to pray for something if you don't believe that God can do it? Why are you going to pray for something and when God does it, how dare you get offended because God does it and somebody who you dismissed is a person who has to tell you that God has already answered your prayer. You can't dismiss Rhoda's perspective. Well, you see, you can be so caught up in building your own stuff, building the status quo, and building, building your own paradigm that you have, you have devoted yourself to building your paradigm to the point that you've built God out of it. And God ain't going to compete with you and your monuments. God going to go on and do what he needs to do. But I'm so glad that the Lord shows up when he wants to show up. That is the gospel story. Well, you see, God didn't go into the inner city. He didn't go into the city of Jerusalem. He didn't go to the temple and make the announcement that the king of Jews has been born. But he showed up outside of town. He showed up in the cover of darkness there. And he showed up to some shepherds watching over their flocks by night. He didn't go to the governor's house. He didn't go to the rich people's house. He didn't go to the high priest's house. He didn't go to the Pharisee's house. But he went to the working man's spot. He went to his job while he's working third shift. And he says, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of glad tidings. Today, a Savior has been born over in Bethlehem. And his name is Jesus. And you need to get that now to see about him. So we can have our prayer meetings if we want to. But to the Rhoda generation, don't be discouraged if you you've been locked out you know that the Lord is real you know that God is moving around you you know that God can open doors that no man can open you've seen God do the unthinkable you've seen God do the impossible stand on what you know and stand on what you believe and tell everybody what you see God doing so what if they have in their meeting stand on what you believe the powers that be said, Rhoda, be quiet. We in here praying. Rhoda, you must be crazy. But I love this part right here. The Bible says, the Bible says that she kept insisting. She kept insisting. See, the establishment did not affirm her. But she kept on us insisting. The powers that be did not they did not mentor her. They did not invest in her. They did not encourage her. They did not say, baby, what is it? Come in and tell us all about it. Let's come show us, baby, what you're talking about. They didn't, they didn't come and put their arms around her and try to mentor her and nurture her in her faith. But she kept on insisting. Again, I don't know who this word is for, but you, you looking for the establishment to nurture you. But they won't always do that. They won't always affirm what you believe. They won't always celebrate what you see God doing. They ain't always trying to hear what you have come to know for yourself. They may try to dismiss you. And they may try to tell you that you are out of your mind. Her perspective wasn't valued. But nonetheless, they felt like it is only so if we see it with our own eyes. But I'm so glad that Luke added this in here. But she insisted. And when you insist something, sometimes you just got to be out of order. She had to act a fool probably with them for them finally to actually hear what she had to say. She insisted. She did not allow what they told her. And how many times have we dismissed folk because they were a nuisance to us? How many times have we told people we ain't trying to hear that right now? How many times have you said not right now? How many times have you said it's not your time? How many times have you told somebody this ain't going to do it? How many times have you said this ain't the place? How many times have you said why they keep on singing the same thing over and over? How many times have you said they too loud? How many times have you said I don't feel like hearing that mess? How many times have you said they need to go on somewhere with that? How many times 
times have you said that ain't real music? How many times have you said how dare they come dressed like that? How many times have you said I can't believe they got the nerve to stand up there and do that stuff inside of us as church and us as place and us as season? How dare they stand up there? Don't they know the protocol? We are New Hope Baptist Church. We don't do that here. We don't walk like that. We don't talk like that. We don't dress like that. We don't sing like that. But they belong to God just like they belong. They belong here just like you do. And they ain't got to sing the way you sing. They ain't got to dress the way you dress. They ain't got to clap the way you clap. They may want to rap it. They may want to flip it. They may want to cheer it. They may want to sign it. They may want to text it. They may want to make paper airplanes. But the Bible says let everything that have breath, let him praise the Lord. So, this road of generation is going to be important for us if we're going to have any kind of relevance and future. And so we cannot dismiss their spirit. And we cannot dismiss their perspective. And then finally, we certainly cannot dismiss their praise. You see, Rhoda, Rhoda had her own program. Saints come together with a formality, and they were kneeling down to pray. I don't know if they were kneeling or what, but the Bible says that they were intentional about their praying. And they were so caught up in their praying that they had completely missed the move of God. And in their missing the move of God, Rhoda did the only thing she knew how to do. She came in, and she came in with her praise. She came in with her testimony. She came in with her excitement. She came in with a story on her heart. She came in with a report because she believed that God had heard her prayer. But not only did she come in, but she didn't come in selfishly either. But Rhoda came in and she came in realizing, hey everybody, we've been praying for Peter. And I got good news to tell you that Peter is outside at the door. Rhoda had come in telling everybody that Peter is outside at the door. God has answered our prayers. Rhoda got so excited, she didn't even take the time to let Peter in the house. But she left him outside because she was so excited about what God had done. Rhoda had come into the only place she knew to come. The place where she should have been accepted. Because worship was already going on and worship was going on because they were praying and Rhoda came in with a praise on her lips and they tried to extinguish her praise by calling her crazy but Rhoda said no I know what I'm talking about Peter is outside at the gates and so Rhoda came in with her praise and she came in praising the best way that she knew how and her praise may have offended some folk but it's still was sweet music to God the Bible says out of the mouths of babes and sucklings I have ordained praise don't tell young folk they don't know how to praise God don't tell young people that they don't know God for themselves don't tell young people that they too young to know that God is real because I tell you what, if you're going to be, you can be dead all you want. But I'm so glad that some people come in here and they come in here a little bit different from the rest of us. I get excited when our people who are not too dignified to stand to their feet and wave their hands. I get excited when I see people who will stand up and just shout hallelujah in the middle of anything going on. I get excited because I know that these are folk who realize how good God is been and if you would just join me and think about the goodness of God and if you think about him long enough I 
promise you praise will come on your lips. I promise you if you think about what the Lord had to deliver you from, you can't sit there in your seat and act like he owed it to you all alone. If you sit there and just think about where the Lord has brought you from, you know that you don't deserve all of his goodness and his grace. I am looking for the people who know that he was only by the grace of God. That's why I have what I have. That's why I am who I am. Where are the people at who know that if it had not been for the Lord who was on your side, you don't know where you would be. Let those people say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. God's been too good for us to sit as if he has owed us anything and so we got to be like Rhoda and sometimes we just got to break up the meeting and we just got to come in there all country we got to come in there all out of order we just got to come in there disrupting stuff we got to come in tearing up the status quo we got to come in rearranging some chairs we got to come in moving some people out of the way we got to come in stepping on some toes we got to come in with some shock therapy we got to come in and tell folk this is the real deal if we're going to pray we need to celebrate what we're praying for and when the lord moves we need to let him know we see him at work y'all too busy praying and you made the prayer be about your own activity but prayer ain't about your activity prayer is about the activity of God and when God has moved I want to affirm that I have seen it I have seen the lightning flash I have heard the thunder roll I have felt sin breakers dashing trying to conquer my soul but I heard the voice of my Savior telling me still fight on he promised never to leave me never to leave me alone and so I'm gonna give him praise every step of the way God bless you to the road of generation God bless you to the next generation of praises God bless you to the next season of Saints God bless you to the future of New Hope Baptist Church God bless you they may not see him the way you see him but they still see him they may not praise him the way that you praise him but they still know that he's good they might not do it when you think they should do it but they will do it and they might not do it the way that you have affirmed or you have given permission for it to be but God will still honor it and God will still move and so guess what I might not be able to do it the way they do it, but I'm going to get right in. And I'm going to lift my holy hands. And I'm going to sing my James Cleveland. I'm going to sing my Mahalia Jackson. I'm going to sing my Williams Brothers and my Mighty Clouds of Joy. And a little bit of Travis Green and Kirk Franklin and everybody else that I know. Because the God that I know is bigger. He's bigger. He's bigger than these little boxes that we put him in. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Listen. I was trying to make an argument. Not just for this church in this season. More importantly, I'm trying to make an argument for everybody who's felt dismissed by the establishment by establishment I'm not talking about just what's happened in New Hope Baptist Church but I'm saying that there are people who knows what it feels like to be an outsider there are people in here who knows what it feels like to not have status in the eyes of men but I want you to know that status conferred upon you by men still God breaks through that tears that down and I'm saying on behalf of New Hope Baptist Church I am apologizing to any person in here who has ever felt like you were made to be less than because you didn't look like you didn't talk like, 
You didn't dress like. You didn't live like. You didn't praise like. You didn't pray like. You didn't give like. You didn't worship like the establishment. I'm apologizing on behalf of this congregation because I know it has happened. I know it has happened because people have told me. I don't have to go into detail about what I know, so don't worry about it. It ain't none of your business. But just know that it is so. And I'm saying on behalf of this church, first I apologize to God because we've sinned against Him. But secondly, I apologize to every rota in the room. But now, Rhoda, I need you to understand this. That just because we have misstepped does not give you license to misstep as well. You see, Rhoda in the scripture could have just stayed huddled up with the rest of the saints while the door was knocking. She could have gone out there and heard that it was Peter and just gone right back in and got back on her knees. Because after all, she could have said, I'm just a slave. And Peter's in jail. And I'm not going to open this door. So Rhoda, you still, you still got to sing your song. You got to clap your hands. You got to insist on it. Just as Rhoda did in the Bible. Rhoda, don't worry about when people look at you funny. Keep on doing it. Because it's making God smile. Rhoda. Don't worry about it if people move down from you in the aisle. That's all right. They just give you more room to express your satisfaction and your gratitude about how good God has been. Rhoda, you may be in the minority today, but you'll just keep on and more Rhodas will keep coming. You keep on going because you see Rhoda was a game changer. Because you see, if they don't listen to Rhoda, Peter stays outside. The Bible says that, that Peter kept on knocking. And finally, they had to go out there and open up the door. But nobody said, Rhoda told us you was out here. <laughs> See, don't worry about that, Rhoda, because, you know, folk, their egos and their pride won't let them give you your props. But this ain't about you, Rhoda. It's about him. And so you just keep on telling everybody what the truth is. And the truth is that Peter's outside. The truth is that God is answering prayers. The truth is that God is moving. Keep on singing your songs, Rhoda. Keep on doing your dance, Rhoda. Keep on clapping your hands, Rhoda. But you got to be connected to the community. I'm glad that Rhoda did not take her spirit, take her song, and take her perspective and walk out of Mary's house never to return. But Rhoda stayed there and she kept on praising. And she kept on believing. And she kept on trusting. And God blessed her still. So Rhoda, don't get discouraged. We, you just ahead of your time, Rhoda. You just gotten to where God is trying to get us to. So Rhoda, just wait. Get, just be patient with us for a little while. Just walk with us. But I assure you, Rhoda, that you're not by yourself. In fact, you're looking at a Rhoda right here. I know what it feels like for people to look at you funny. And for people to tell you that you're wrong. And for people to tell you that it can't be so. And for people to tell you that it won't work. And it can't happen. And that it won't be that way. And for people to call you crazy. And tell you I wouldn't advise that. And it's not going to look like that. You looking at a rotor. But it look like I'm doing alright if I say so myself. And it's not because of anything that I've done. But I just kept giving God my praise. I just kept insisting on what I believe God was doing. I kept on insisting on it. And the Lord kept on moving. And the Lord kept on working. And so I'm going to keep on walking. And I'm going to keep on praising. And I'm going to keep on singing. And I'm going to keep on doing. So now, there may be a rota in here tonight. Right now, this morning. Maybe somebody sitting here right now feeling like a misfit among so many but you're not a misfit or I tell you what if you feel like a misfit you in good company because all of us in here are misfits because God made us a peculiar people we ain't supposed to be fitting God made us different 
Rhoda, I need you to hear me. We need you. God needs you. What you feel in your heart, it is real. What you hear God saying, it is real. If it is aligned with his word. God is saying, Rhoda, I want you just the way that you are. I don't want you to look like them. I want you like you are. Rhoda, if you're here, just come this way. Just come this way. Our counselors are standing. We're not going to ask you. You don't have to justify why you come here. You don't owe us an explanation. We just want to identify you. What I'm saying is we're offering you the opportunity now to start your own personal journey of faith with the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe there's somebody here and you don't have connection with the local church fellowship. But listen, I meant it when I said it. That there may be people in here, you've been wounded by the church. You've been dismissed by the church. And the church has made you feel unworthy and less than. I'll be the first to admit that we're not a perfect church. You just heard me say that I've had to apologize on behalf of this church. Because we have treated some folk like Rhoda. But I'm still telling you, Rhoda, you got a home here. Because you're not going to find a perfect church. But I believe that this is a church that is sincere in our endeavors to honor God to love his people and so we'd love for you to be a part of our family if you're here why don't you come why don't you come right now just just get up and come because you know what you've got something valuable that's going to make us better and I know we've got something valuable that will make you better first appeal is for that person who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal savior first appeal is for that person who does not have a personal relationship with the God of heaven if you're that person you saying, you know what I really need my own experience with God it starts right here making this decision all you have to do is just get up from wherever you are step out into the aisle and start coming this way you'll be greeted you'll be received we'll take you into a space where you have privacy we'll counsel with you we'll answer whatever questions you have You'll start your journey today. Next appeal is for that person who maybe you already know Jesus Christ as your Savior, but you know that you are not connected to a local church fellowship. Friend, I need you to know something. I'm, I'm glad that you are a Christian, but if you are a Christian and you're not in a church, you are outside of the will of God for your life. There's no such thing as a Christian who doesn't need a church. No such thing as a churchless Christian. Just like there's no such thing as a fish who lives out of water. You've never seen a fish in a cage. Think about it. You ever gone to the zoo and seen a fish in a cage? No. Every fish you're going to see that's living, he's in a tank, he's in an aquarium, he's in water. Every Christian that you ever meet, a real Christian, he better be in a church. You show me somebody who says that I'm a Christian, but they're not in a church. And I'm going to show you somebody who's not a Christian. This is the will of God. and We want you to be in his will. Is it God's will that you join this church? Not necessarily. But it is his will that you belong to somebody's church. And I know a place. In fact, I said it earlier. It's the best church on the planet. Hands down. I know a place. We're not perfect. We're not perfect. But we'd love for you to be a part of our family. If I'm talking to you this morning, why don't you come? Why don't you come? We'll wait for you. Because I know somebody's wrestling with this decision. Somebody's wrestling with this decision. Nobody told me you were coming. Nobody told me you were coming. You sit out there thinking, man, why does he keep looking at me? I ain't even looking at you. I'm not looking at you. I'm just, just moving across the room. Don't think nobody called me and told me your business or anything like that. But if you really feel like something is tugging at you, that's God's Holy Spirit. That's God saying, I'm ready for you to come home today. If you're here and you know that he's speaking to you, I promise you, if you would surrender, I, I just believe that somebody else will follow suit. Nobody wants to be that first one. 
Because getting up, you think, man, everybody's going to think there's something wrong with me. There's absolutely nothing wrong with you. Look at it this way. The longer you stay in that seat, the longer you delay getting more of what God wants to do for you and with you. So you can stay in the seat all you want. But all you do is delay how God wants to bless you. You can let what other folk think of you keep you from your blessing. Or you could say, I could care less what they think. Because they don't have a heaven or a hell to put me in. And they didn't die for me. They're not taking care of me. And so I want what the Lord has for me. Why don't you come? You don't want to come by yourself. Lift your hand. I'm on my way. I come wherever you are. Greet you personally. Lift your hand. I'll come. I'll come down the aisle. Won't even say excuse me. I just step on people. I'll come right where you are. Because this is too serious. The moment is too serious for us to trivialize it. Rush through it. Just giving God's spirit time to work. But if you're here. We would love, we would love to extend God's love and grace to you.